Hello, and welcome to Working Historians, a podcast series where we discuss what historians do with their lives. I am Rob Denning, Associate Dean for Liberal Arts for Southern New Hampshire University's online history programs. Now, in my day job, working for SNHU, I work with a lot of very talented people, and over the next few episodes, I want to highlight the great work of some of those colleagues in SNHU's Career Services Office. Over the past six months or so, staffers in that office have recorded interviews with key employees in a number of companies and organizations across the country for my other podcast series, Passion and Practicality, a liberal arts podcast. Some of those episodes are probably of particular interest to listeners of working historians, though, so I am rebroadcasting the history-related episodes here over the next couple of months. We have met one or two of these historians before on Working Historians, but the others will be new, and all of them will have lots of interesting things to say. One voice that we have heard before is Tim Garrity. When Jimmy and I first talked to Tim back in 2017, he was the director of the Mount Desert Island Historical Society in Maine. He has, unfortunately, retired since then. Well, fortunately for him, unfortunately for the rest of us. But I caught up with him a while back to talk some more about how liberal arts students can market themselves more effectively for a variety of careers, and about his views on the liberal arts in general. This interview was originally broadcast on the Passion and Practicality podcast feed on September 30th, 2022. Hello, and welcome to Passion and Practicality, a podcast series where the faculty, staff, and guests of Southern New Hampshire University's liberal arts programs discuss the career paths open to graduates of those programs, the research and creative work of practitioners in those fields, and whatever other interesting stuff comes our way. I am Rob Denning, Associate Dean for Liberal Arts for Southern New Hampshire University's online history programs. As promised a couple months ago, I am broadening the scope of my conversations with academics and professionals a bit to look at different fields within what academics like to call the liberal arts. For our purposes, liberal arts includes history, but also different fields like communications, graphic design, graphic arts, philosophy, creative writing, literature, and English, among others. Last year, I talked to a bunch of interesting people affiliated with those fields, and I'm going to share the recordings of those conversations here. I looked for people outside of academics who can talk about the importance of the liberal arts in the business world. I looked for entrepreneurs, CEOs, and business owners. The resulting conversations range a bit across different topics, but I try to find answers to some core questions that apply across the liberal arts that matter to students in liberal arts programs and alumni who hold degrees in those programs. These questions include, why are students with liberal arts degrees valuable to employers? What can students in liberal arts programs do to make themselves more valuable or marketable to employers? And why do the liberal arts matter to you and in our modern culture? In this episode, I'm talking to Tim Garrity who served as a hospital administrator and as the director of the Mount Desert Island Historical Society. Here we discuss Tim's background, his attraction to the liberal arts, his advice to students contemplating the pursuit of degrees in history, the humanities, and the liberal arts in general, and the skill sets that students of the liberal arts can bring to any employer or career. What is your name and what do you do? My name is Tim Garrity, and I am a historian at the Mount Desert Island Historical Society. And listeners to my regular podcast have heard us talk to uh, Tim Garrity before, and so welcome back. Um, And today we're going to talk a little bit more about liberal arts in general, rather than focusing specifically on history and the uh, historical society that Tim works for. But before we get into all of that, Tim, can you tell us a little bit about your uh, academic and professional background? Sure, uh, Rob. I am a uh, I, I, one of those people who uh, kind of stumbled into one career and decided that it wasn't the right one for me and changed over. I uh, was in the Navy. I was a hospital corpsman, and uh, while in the Navy, I took courses in healthcare administration. And one uh, one day led to the next, and before you know it, I had twenty five years as a healthcare executive. I have worked at places like uh, George Washington University and um, Johns Hopkins and health systems in Pennsylvania and then in Blue Hill, Maine. But I came to a crossroads in life where I decided I just hadn't done all the things that I wanted to do. And I had an opportunity to uh, make a career change. I enrolled in the graduate program in history at the University of Maine and uh, graduated in 2014 with a MA degree in history. 
Uh, but so before that, I had uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in healthcare administration. But you know, all that time while I was in my career, day to day work, I would always be a little envious of uh, programs like uh, programs in the liberal arts, and really had a hunger for that kind of uh, work or that kind of life. And um, I, I was able to do that at a, a rather advanced age. But I've been in my new career as a historian for uh, over 10 years now. When you say that the liberal arts was attractive to you your first time around in college, what was so attractive about it? You know, I uh, I think for the same reason that uh, music pulls at young people, there's uh, speaking to passions that in our lives that we want to uh, express or literature that's moved you. I, I know I wanted to uh, see the country and be out in the world. And I you know, thought of uh, writers like John Steinbeck, or I, I've, I've just had a natural history of, uh, or natural interest in history that um, made me curious about Irish literature and poetry and music. It's sort of hard to say why, but it's something that I found uh, uh, fulfilling in a spiritual or soulful way. It was uh, like a, if there was an empty spot, uh, empty place inside, this was the kind of thing that spoke that spoke to it and addressed it. Because it sounds like you faced what I'm betting that a lot of college students face is the idea when you're getting into college, trying to decide what your major is going to be. There's kind of the, for a lot of students anyway, there's the tug of liberal arts for kind of the emotional creativity cultural part of it that you've just described. But then there's also the pull of what a lot of people correctly or incorrectly may think of as a more lucrative career in things like healthcare management or, you know, STEM, that kind of thing. And so it sounds like you you were kind of one of those students. And so the first time around, you went with the the STEM route or, or healthcare route. And then the second time around, you went with the liberal arts. And so I'm wondering if you have any type of suggestions or advice for students that might be kind of going through that decision right now? Well, I think that you can keep that flame alive. I mean, people have to pay bills and uh, there are ways perhaps that uh, a life in the working world and a life in the uh, liberal arts can uh, be combined. For, for instance, uh, you can prepare yourself better for a life in the liberal arts, or the, which often is found in nonprofit organizations, if uh, you take on skills that are especially useful there. For instance, um, fundraising is something that is applicable across all the all the uh, throughout the nonprofit world, and a skill set in that area can be uh, can supplement your desire for music or poetry or or art. You have kind of combine hard skills with your heart's desire. Or if you do find yourself in a nursing program or uh, healthcare administration, there are ways that you can express your love of uh, the humanities in that, in that workplace. I know as a hospital CEO, I would write a, a newsletter for the hospital community that would often pull on the hospital's history as a way of uh, putting current events and what we need to accomplish in, in context. So I think the liberal arts, the humanities can be a, a lifelong pursuit no matter where you plant yourself, but you can try to steer yourself towards one in which you can make a living in the arts. Yeah. And I think that's probably something that worth dwelling on a little bit is the idea that you can still employ a liberal arts type skills and creativity, even in non-liberal arts type careers. And your example in the newsletters, or for example, for the hospitals you were talking about, that's that's a good example of that. Now that you've kind of occupied management positions in in both worlds, you don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to set this up as like an industry versus liberal arts type thing, but you know what I mean? You've kind of been in the business, the, the hospital world and historical society world. What type of commonalities uh, do you see between those two types of careers? Well, there's a, there certainly are a lot. Uh, in any kind of working environment, you need to be able to communicate effectively. 
And so skills in spoken and written language are universally required. You know, the ability to communicate clearly is uh, essential. And one of the ways that we communicate clearly is by tapping into our ability to be empathetic towards other people, to, uh, to understand your audience. And that type of skill can come from a degree, uh, from a s- studies in acting or studies in, uh, in literature. I think uh, anybody who reads poetry has to be tapped into an empathetic relationship with the poet. You, you, you have an ability to understand what the poet is trying to communicate, what he or she is feeling. And if you can accomplish, if, if, if you can comprehend that, I think those are skills that will make a difference in that, in a more business oriented or, or STEM world. And those, those are skills that are appreciated and needed. In both worlds that you've worked in, are there, are there skills that you've hoped liberal arts students would focus more on uh, during their college years that maybe they wouldn't be getting through normal courses, but that they might want to get in some sort of other experience outside of the, the classroom that you think would make them more valuable to employers across these different industries? Well, I think um, the ability to work as part of a team is uh, critical. You seldom have some sort of employment where you're alone. So understanding other people, figuring out how to make your whole uh, team more effective, those are skills that um, can be learned on a stage, uh, on a playing field, or in uh, group projects. Those turn out to be a lot more essential than advertised to understand other people, how to work with all kinds of different people in a very uh, diverse workplace. I think of uh, some of the people we've encountered, some of the young students that we've encountered that have been very successful, and often they come from uh, a liberal arts background, and it's the general demeanor of being eager to learn, uh, eager to listen and understand, yet uh, having a creative and independent mindset that allows you to express yourself and do good uh, creative work all in a setting that fits what the organization as a whole is trying to accomplish. I think those turn out to be essential and are a good fit uh, wherever you land. I kind of made a list of, uh, you know, in preparation for this, of uh, student interns or uh, relatively new employees that we've we've had uh, and what skill sets they they brought in a lot of times they're they seem almost personality based but these were particulars of their qualities that really worked in the uh, in the real work environment they've been very pleasant to work with they've really been delightful in they come not just as blank slates, but they have a lot to offer. And I think often young people entering the working world feel like they've got everything to learn. But we found that uh, these people I'm thinking of also had a lot to offer. And maybe it's not the right place to name names, but I'll just think of one young woman that uh, has worked with us, is now working on an MFA, a Master of Fine Arts in Poetry at Oregon State University. And she brought us skills in uh, videography, in uh, graphic design. She has served as a copy editor for our journal. She's a real uh, wordsmith. She cares a lot about words and uh, can put them together in ways that uh, help us communicate more effectively. She is uh, a musician and uh, combined as an artistic sense that helped our communications go out into the world in a way that uh, was appealing to our audience. These are all skills I think you would have the opportunity to learn and practice in a 
in a liberal arts environment. We had another student who's currently a uh, uh, English literature major at uh, University of Pennsylvania. And he took a summer job with us uh, curating a collection of postcards and letters from a soldier serving in France in the First World War. So he is a young man, the, the guy I'm thinking of, who is working with the letters back home of a young man, the two of them separated by a century. And he had the ability to uh, understand what was, uh, uh, what was meaningful in this big stack and to uh, apply some of these uh, communications or understand and put in context communications from uh, his counterpart a century removed in a way that helped that project get become a lot more uh, appealing again uh, so we could put it together in a way that an audience would find attractive uh, there was another uh, student who worked with us she was a uh, uh, I think a PhD candidate in, in literature. And um, she did a, a, a now, uh, transcribed the log books of a group called the Champlain Society. They're a group of young students who came to our part of the state of Maine and um, studied the environment and history of the place. And she took these log books that were intended to be rough notes about the history and found all the sources that they had drawn from the, the early, the, the stories of the earliest explorers and uh, helped create a historiographical context for it. Even though this is not her field, you know, she's writing poetry, but she's uh, was someone who really can closely read material and understand that it all has a, a source and uh, that became an important part of her project. Uh, and then the last example is a, uh, a young woman who's been with us for quite a while. I, I first met her as a, when she was about 18 and she's pushing 30 and has two children now. She uh, worked for us initially. Uh, she has a, a degree in human ecology and she worked for us initially as a general office assistant. So she had a lot to learn about accounting and information systems, but brought this creative element that uh, kept any of that from getting dry. She had a very imaginative approach and a sense of uh, community life and our connection to the community that became a very important part of our brand and our, our presence here. She uh, went on to earn a graduate degree in the Netherlands in uh, cultural administration. She, uh, after leaving our employment, she became a member of our board of directors and uh, has uh, uh, composed a strategic plan for our organization based on what you know, the skill set she learned in graduate school, but also what she, her knowledge of this uh, of this community. So those, that's a handful of people that we've worked with that have been extraordinarily successful. And I don't think they would have been successful absent a strong, strong background in liberal arts. It definitely demonstrates the diverse viewpoints that the liberal arts can instill in people. As you've, if you've got people with history backgrounds and then other people with literature backgrounds and English backgrounds, and they're all kind of tackling a lot of the same primary sources, but arriving at very different conclusions and using them for very different purposes. I think that really speaks to the kind of the diversity of the liberal arts um, and the different methodologies that different branches of the liberal arts can bring to the table. But uh, even if everyone's doing it, coming at it differently, they're all still kind of advancing you know, human knowledge and all of that. So I think that, that that is an interesting example. And so I'm really glad you brought those, those specific examples into that. That really helps. Well, I, I think that the liberal arts have a way of imparting wisdom, uh, even to people at a very young age. You know, often we think of wisdom as something that's acquired over time, and surely it is, but you can get a jump on that <laughs> if, mm -hmm. uh, if wisdom consists of uh, understanding uh, people 
because so much of it is borrowed from you know, great literature and, and uh, great art. Uh, that applies in ev everyday life. We're finding the wonderful, uh, the ability to find the wonderful in the commonplace. So much of uh, great art is uh, a product of that, taking simple things in simple places like music and making it into something art artistic and beautiful. And these are all things that uh, quality organizations uh, want to have in their, um, in their employees. I think another thing to be said about it too is that um, these people I mentioned also brought skills that they had learned in school that we didn't have inside our organization. We didn't have uh, graphic arts or um, someone who was going to be excellent with copy editing because she's obsessed with w words. These are all, students don't come empty handed. Uh, and often if they're entering a workplace with older people, they may have um, skills in computer technology or uh, just uh, awareness of everyday life and how to reach new audiences that uh, uh, lots of organizations don't have. And that's a good point. That's something that liberal arts majors need to keep in mind when they're applying, when they're putting together their resume, their CV, is it is a good idea for them to emphasize the skills that particular employers probably don't have much of. And so like the graphic graphic design uh, example that you had there is, is, is a good example of that because there's a lot of companies that if they're looking for a new employee, they may not even know that they're lacking a particular skill. They may not even know what they're looking for. But if liberal arts majors can effectively identify and promote the skills that they have, then that may open the door for them at an institution that may not have otherwise really had a, a, a position for them. But if they're able to show that, hey, I'm able to bring these new skills into it that you weren't even aware you were you were lacking, then that's a whole new kind of tactic that liberal arts people can pursue. And um, the, the liberal arts help us understand humanity. They, they help us understand the world of the other person. And I think uh, organizations are looking for people who can work well inside the workplace as part of a group, but also comprehend what the outside world is looking for from an organization because they've developed, they've attuned themselves to some of those skills. And, and these are skills that are critical, a little harder to quantify, but uh, you might not get exposed to in a world where you're just looking at um, the hard and fast fact, uh, you know, the uh, kind of a world of accounting or, uh, or, uh, or finance or science, uh, but really emphasize those human to human interpersonal qualities that are critical, just as critical as having the hard skill set. Do you have any, are there any thoughts on kind of the importance of the liberal arts that we haven't really discussed yet that you think are, are worth noting? The comparison that comes to mind, I don't know if this will be useful to you, but I, we have uh, neighbors and uh, he is a scientist who works with uh, genetic engineering and uh, uh, gene splicing, hard science. And she is a, uh, an artist who works with impressionistic landscapes. And they are uh, kind of a perfect match. I think that one makes life possible and the other makes life worth living. You can't have one without the other. And, you know, they both are. They both excel in their fields and complement one another and appreciate one another. They appreciate uh, eat, that each have skills and expertise beyond their reach in the other. But uh, I think, in a way, that represents what this world is all about. That we we need the uh, skill sets of the scientists and the technologists, but we also need the, uh, the art, you know, the, the current crisis that we're going through with COVID-19 shows the vital nature of people in the healthcare profession and scientists who are trying to develop a vaccine, but also everybody quarantined is ho at home is, uh, turning desperately to the arts to make their life fulfilling and meaningful. And these, the, the scientists who are 
working so hard are and, and the healthcare people working so hard are working out of a sense of human compassion and are demonstrating qualities of courage that are uh, admirable and I think will take their place in some of the great historical narratives that will come out of this uh, that will come out of this episode. Oh, that's great. I think that's a great way to kind of summarize where we were going with all of this. And um, I like that example of the uh, scientist and the artist. <laughs> that's a great combination. Yeah. So thank you for joining me today, Tim. Thanks for the invitation, Rob. It's always nice to talk to you. And thank you all for listening. This episode appears on the Passion and Practicality podcast feed, and you can subscribe to that feed on any podcast app, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, or whatever else you prefer. For Tim Garrity and the entire liberal arts faculty and staff at Southern New Hampshire University, I'm Rob Denning. Take care now.